and you are good to go. Thank you, Marco. Okay, you're welcome. Qualsiasi roba, chiama. Grazie. Io la porto quando va. Grazie. È perfetto. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this analysis seminar. It's a pleasure to have with us our associate, uh, John Bonio, who's coming here for his first associate visit from Kenya. Hope that there will be many more. John will talk to us today about the composition semi-group and some analytic spaces of the upper half plane. John, floor is yours. Welcome to ICTP. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I will uh, give a talk on composition semi-group on some uh, analytic spaces of the upper half plane. As as you've been told, I'm John Bonin uh, uh, from Kenya. My university is uh, Multimedia University of Kenya in Nairobi, the Department of Mathematics. Thank you. So I will uh, begin by giving some uh, introduction and probably setting up the notation for my talk and the definitions that are necessary for us to be able to I mean, analyze our semigroup. So first of all, we have the disk, that block D is the unit disk. So the unit disk is it's a complex number, it's a set of complex numbers. So if you have the complex plane, then uh, We are basically talking about that is what we call the unit disk. It is open, so the boundary to the unit circle here is not part of the disk. Then we have uh, the upper half, we call it the upper half plane, which is uh, denoted again by U, this blocked U. Again, it is the set of complex numbers. For which the imaginary part is strictly positive. And if I would sketch that, then I would be talking about the upper of this complex plane. And remember, it's also open, so the line, the boundary of the upper half plane, which is the x axis, is not included. Now, these two domains, I will call them domains, subsets of the complex plane, have an interesting relation between them. There exists an invertible map between the U and D, given by that, so that we can always map back and forth. For instance, a point zero on the disk is mapped to the point I on the upper half plane. So, uh, I will also define the, the measure, just give them different notations so that I have a Lebesgue measure on the upper half plane, which is the mu, and then a Lebesgue measure on the unit disk, which is uh, the m. I will use that so that we don't confuse when I use, because I will always be moving back and forth sometimes between the two uh, domains. So now I want to define uh, spaces of analytic functions. We consider, I will use the omega here. I will use the omega to denote an open subset. So omega can be D, basically, can be the disk or the power. So because I don't want to define for each, I will just use the omega for a general term. And then that H of omega will be denoting the space of analytic functions on omega. So those functions, actually we expect them to be mapping our open subset of C to C itself. Then we have Bachmann spaces. Now these are uh, very famous uh, spaces of analytic functions. And Bachmann space, interestingly, is just the usual LP space, but that that 
will consist only of analytic functions. So that's why we, we will define the Bergman space. The upper half plane is the LP space, the usual limit space. In, 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 you will intersect that with, the, of course, we select only analytic functions. While the Bergman space on the disk, then it's just the usual LP space. And uh, I mean, those analytic functions in those spaces. Of course, they have their respective norms. On the LP, carries over to the norm that we have. I'm, I'm, I mean, sorry, I'm assuming that we understand the LP space, so we know the norm, because these are integrable functions. But let me allow you just to state the norm. So if we are we have a function on L here beyond the Bergman space. You can use mu, you will allow me to abuse notation a little bit. Use mu. Uh, let's say I raise it to P. It's just the integral of the upper half plane of F, let's say of Z. So that is the norm. Find on the Lebel space, I mean the Bergman space of the upper half plane. And when I change it to V, I mean, it's the same, I mean, on all, except now the domain changes. Then we have another space called the Hardy space. And remember, we are not dealing with uh, the infinity cases where we, are, we talk of the bounded analytic functions. We are basically considering between one and infinity, one inclusive. Now, Hardy spaces now will be defined by this norm. Look at, uh, sorry, let's go back. Now, if you look at the norm on the Hardy space of the upper half plane, it's given by that, while the norm on the Hardy space of the Euro disk is given by that. All these analytic functions consist of uh, analytic functions. Uh, interestingly, uh, for Hardy space, we have a characterization on, on the norms of the Hardy space that we can actually identify the functions on the Hardy space by their boundary values so that we can redefine the norm. For the case of the upper half plane, we can just define it on the free line, the x axis. Yes, while for the unit disk, we can define it on the boundary of uh, the disk, I mean, which is just the unit circle, so it is between 0 and 2 by. Then another analytic uh, space that we are going to be interested in is the derivative space of the unit disk uh, and of the upper half plane, of course. Now unit disk, I mean, for the derivative space, it is only defined for the case P equals 2, So we only talk about the derivative space for the case of true, so that you can see for the derivative space of the disk, and this is the norm. I mean, we expect this quantity here to be finite, set of all those analytic functions for which this quantity is finite. Uh, the, the, what we are defining as uh, using uh, the norm on D, I mean, on D naught, it's a semi norm on the derivative, I mean, derivative space of the disk in this case, and we can make it a norm by adding this constant. So that this it becomes a norm, the norm on the derivative space is given by this. Similarly, for the derivative space of the upper half plane, the same happens. Now we are adding f at i. Remember, zero is not to i on the upper half plane. And then uh, we have this. You can see that there is a, a relation between the derivative space and the Bergman space in the sense that here is the derivative, but on the other side we just talk of f. Now, so those are the three spaces that uh, are of interest uh, to us. There are many more analytic spaces uh, which probably we are subject to another day.
we define a composition operator. First of all, we have a self-analytic map on the domain that we consider. So we have a self-analytic map on omega. Then that self-analytic map will indeed use a composition operator on a specific analytic function. And then by this. Now we can have a family of self-analytic maps that constitute a one parameter symbol where our parameter is the t given here. So it, it will be, this family will be a same group if they are analytic functions and then they satisfy this. Now, the same way a self analytic map will induce a composition operator, the same way a semi group of self analytic maps will also induce a semi group of composition operators. So, this is what is the same definition. These are one parameter semi groups. Now, sometimes when we are dealing with the composition operators, we are probably interested in adding some kind of a weight so that we talk of probably weighted composition, same rules of composition operators. So, this is uh, how we define the semi group of weighted composition. As we shall see later on that this can be a group because all we need to have is the inverse. Remember, if it is T. semi group then when we, call, we consider the negative part then we talk of G in R then we talk of uh, the group so I will be using these terms groups and uh, semi groups interchangeably but what we know that our semi groups in this case are also groups Now, in general, a semi-group of uh, bounded linear operators on a given Banach space. And remember here, all those are spaces are Banach spaces, with respect to those ones. And in the cases when people so draw are actually Hilbert spaces. I think it is important to tell of that. Another thing is that all these uh, functions are bounded by we have a growth condition for each and every space. Now, we say that uh, a semi-group T sub T is strongly continuous if it satisfies this property here. The limit of this norm will be zero. Then it is strongly continuous. And if it is strongly continuous, we can talk about its infinitesimal generator, which is basically given by this limit, and it's the same as working out this derivative, and if I'm getting a T zero. And of course, the domain will be those points for which the limit exists. Now, why the upper half plane? I didn't mention this, but I think it's important to take note that, uh, of the fact that most of the studies on composition operators or composition, composition semi groups are based on analytic spaces of the units. And we actually expect, because uh, if we have a lot on the disk, on this analytic spaces of the disk, then we know that we have uh, an invertible map between the two. Then somebody would expect that, of course, these properties would be carried over from the disk to the upper half plane. Trivial. But that is not what we realize, and we find out that the composition operators exhibit chaotic behaviors, totally different behaviors in the two settings, the this and of the other. And that is why maybe you can see some instances, uh, like a case on every composition operator is known to be bounded. This follows out some principle, I think it is the hard Newton principle. On the hardy space of the unit disk and as well as the Bergman space of the unit disk. 
they are bounded. But on the upper half plane, these places on the upper half plane, the, I mean, boundedness is a big question. Because not every composition operator is bounded on the Hardy space and Bauman spaces of the upper half plane. Again, another something again that is coming out. We know that every composition operator is compact on these two spaces of the unities. But for the case of the upper half plane, they do not support any compact composition operator, which means there do not exist a compact uh, composition operator on the other space of the upper half plane as well as the upper half space. The, upper half plane. the case of uh, the, the related spaces, even I mean, different. It's even complicated because for the directed space, even for the units or on the directed space of the units, it is not true that uh, I mean there are composition operators which are not bounded. The recent data has been proved that there exists now again a compact composition operator on the directed space. Because of this, I think it is worthwhile to look at in detail these operators in this in the new setting of the upper half plane. And this is the focus in uh, recently, probably from around uh, the recent years, and starting from probably 2013 or something like that. There's been a lot of work now going on to try and study composition operators as well as composition same groups in the new setting of the upper half plane. So what I will consider a, a specific group and we were able to classify all these groups, self-analytic, what the semi groups of self-analytic uh, maps which we can also call them groups, groups, they have a half plane. During my work in the, in the PhD, I was able to characterize or to classify all those automorphisms, all those self-analytic maps, uh, those groups, into three distinct groups. So this is one of the groups. And uh, I don't want to go through all these groups, but I will just pick this simple case of uh, Of course, this is uh, a semi-group of analytic maps of the upper half plane. It will induce a composition operator, but I want to consider a weighted one. My weight there is, uh, if you look at uh, my original definition, uh, my weight gamma is one. I have a reason for picking that. And I, that will be clear later. And I also want to consider it just on L2. There is really no problem considering an LP, but to simplify our workings, I want to consider this. Now this, this is now a group, of course, of weighted composition operators, which is now defined on L on the Bagman space of the amount. I want to study these properties of this. So what do we mean when we talk about studying the properties of the group? It will involve, involve probably looking at uh, checking whether this group is strongly continuous. Because remember, we are talking about C0 semi groups, uh, strongly continuous semi groups. So, strong continuity is, is a very important concept in semi group theory of operators. So, when I do that, I want to have this uh, theorem, which is now First of all, giving us the fact that this group here 
is strongly continuous. And again, the isometries. When I know uh, an isometry, then I look at, uh, I know something about the spectral theory and the spectrum of that. If I have a strongly continuous group, then I can be interested in its generator, the infinitesimal generator. Then the infinitesimal generator generally is uh, an unbounded problem, unbounded operator. I would be interested in studying its spectral properties, and in this case, the point spectrum, which is the set of its eigenvalues, as well as the spectrum. If I'm able to get a spectrum, then I'm able to analyze the solvents at those points in the, the solvent set. And this uh, the solvents comes out as non-integral operators in literature. So, then we can go ahead and study the spectrum of the resulting solvent and even the the norm, as well as the spectral radius, and then what's be the actual age. That, that completes the analysis of this specific group. Now I will uh, demonstrate these proofs, the proofs of this, just a sketch, so that we are together on that. So the first thing is isometry. All right, for isometry, we simply use the norm, our body space norm, I mean our power and space norm, on the upper half plane, which is given by this exactly. Remember our group, which is up to F, like this. Then I do change of variables. The change of variables I do there, in this case, is I just pick maybe W or omega to be e raised to minus t, see? So that we use our measure, we will follow, will be given by the, call it the Jacobian. So it will be the derivative of that squared, so that is e to minus 2t, the mu of z. So the, when we change variables, the, and we want to change the measure, that is what do. So that is, if you substitute that, gives us exactly the normal life. Therefore, it's just high isometry. There's a mistake here actually. Here should be squared. There's a square missing there. Sorry about that. Then, what about strong continuity? For strong continuity, you know, we need to prove in the long run, we need to prove that. Tending to zero, t tends to zero on the positive because we are assuming that t is greater or equal to zero. So it can only approach zero from that direction. So how do we do that? We pick a function on L2, and we suppose that uh, we have this t n tending to zero in R. Then we let our fn to be this. Then definitely, we know that uh, Fn will be turning to F, and because of the asymmetry, the norms are equal. Then we use this. And this is a standard, uh, we look at uh, the Lebesgue theory. You realize this. Basically, this is uh, making use of some very important inequality. Every time you study complexity, then this, I mean, this inequality comes in. So that is what we use here. Not our GN, given in that form, where you can see what our A is and what our B is. So definitely, this is what makes GN to be positive, to be greater or equal to zero, and negative. And then at the same time, this will turn close to that. 
return to that. Because if you are telling to, well, I mean, a cell goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and the other one goes to f, so we have that. So the remaining thing is just we use the Fatus lemma, to give us the fact that the name soup is zero, and that would mean that the limit is basically zero. I, I, a lot of details left out there, but that is technically the proof of strong continuity. Yes. Then we compute the infinitesimal generator. We just do the derivative, substitute at zero, gives us that. And that automatically tells us the domain is contained in that. Because the, the integral part or the vital part in the generator is that. Because f is already held to. Now the reverse equal for the domain, also we apply a fundamental theorem of class, and using the fact that uh, this system will be strongly continuous, we are able to show the reverse inequality, so that indeed the domain is equal to that segment. Point spectrum, we just evaluate the eigenvalues, and there is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation, it gives us, leads us to this uh, differential equation here, and if you work it out, you get that. Now, it is known that this kind of, I mean, this kind of, uh, say, polynomial does not belong to the bubble space. This is known there is something that is proved in literature that helps us know that as long as you have just Z rest to anything, that will not be a member of this. So, so that we end up with this function being not been there for n0 to 0. Otherwise, if c is 0, then you have f equal to 0. That cannot be an eigenvector. That is why we conclude that indeed the eigenvector, there is the, this operator, the generator, does not have an eigenvector. I mean, does not have an eigenvector. So, what about the spectrum? Now the spectrum now is, uh, we have proved that the spectrum, I mean the, this our group is an isometry. So the fact that it's a group, it means it is also invertible, whereby the inverse of t sub t is just t. That's why it is a group now. Now, since it is uh, an invertible isometry, then you know its spectrum. You know that the spectrum now is contained in the unit circle. It's a subset. It's, 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 it's contained inside the unit circle. But we find that uh, the spectral mapping theorems, theorem for strongly continuous groups also tells us that E raised to E raised to T, the spectrum of the generator is also a subset of the spectrum of the group. That is how that is statement comes from the spectral mapping theorem for strong continuous groups. Of course, if that is the case, telling, telling us that this must be inside the I mean the unit circle, it means that if I pick any lambda arbitrary in the spectrum, then E goes to T lambda must be equal to 1. If I do that, then, uh, sorry, if I do that, then I find that that is only possible when the real part of lambda is 0. The real part is zero, then technically the spectrum, I mean, is pure imaginary. It's contained there. So that is how we get the contain. 